Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about diuresis and congestive heart failure and we'll discuss physiology and evidence-based review on this topic. We'll start with pharmacokinetics of loop diuretics as it's really important to understand this before moving forward. This would help you understand why some of these studies worked and why the others failed and to draw better inferences from these studies. In this lecture, we'll discuss how loop diuretics work and its nuances. So there are three major loop diuretics that we use, furosemide, bumetanide, and torsemide. These are in fact natriuretics. They block your sodium potassium two chloride channel. So you lose sodium and chloride and the water follows the salt. Bumetanide is the most potent amongst all these three medications. One milligram of bumetanide is equipotent to 20 milligrams of torsemide and 40 milligrams of Lasix. The oral bioavailability of furosemide is the least, is around 50 to 60 percent, while bumetanide and torsemide do not have absorption limited pharmacokinetics. All these three are highly protein bound, around 90 to 95 percent of these drugs are bound to albumin for their transport to kidneys. Half life of furosemide is 2 hours and torsemide is around 6 hours, and the half life of loop diuretics is longer in CKD and heart failure. These are sulfonamide derivatives, except another loop diuretic, which is ethacrinic acid, which is selectively used for patients who have serious reaction to sulfur drugs. Food delays the absorption of furosemide, but not torsemide or bumex. So IV furosemide is around twice as potent as the oral dose. So 20 milligrams of IV Lasix is equal to 40 milligrams of PO Lasix. So in hospital, always use IV Lasix to treat your patient and not the PO. At home, if the patient can avoid taking it with food, it would be more beneficial. However, you can certainly give them torsemide or Bumex. Because they are bound to albumin, they are not filtered across the Bowman's capsule. These are actively secreted in your proximal coronary tubule through organic anion transporter 1 and 2 and multi-drug resistant protein 4. And this is important because the same channels are used to secrete NSAIDs and other uremic anions. So in fact, they compete with each other for this channel. And this is one of the reasons why you develop hyperuricemia in patient on loop diuretics because loop diuretics compete with uric acid in their secretion. This is also the reason why NSAID reduce the activity of loop diuretics because they compete with loops for their secretion in proximal convoluted tubule. How are there other mechanisms by which NSAID reduce the activity of loop diuretics? In chronic kidney disease, you have reduced number of nephrons, so you have limited ECT availability. Also, these uremic anions are competing with loop diuretics in their secretion in the proximal convoluted tubules. So you need higher doses for the same effect. As a general rule for diuresis, you multiply the dose of the Lasix to be given multiplied by the creatine to get an approximate idea where to start. So for example, in a normal person, if you wanted to give 40 of Lasix, if their creatinine is two, you start with 80. If their creatinine is three, start with 120. Bumex is an interesting loop diuretic because apart from the active secretion, this is also filtered in your glomeruli. So it can attain higher concentration in tubules in CKD. Therefore, in advanced chronic kidney disease, Bumex may be more useful in achieving diuresis. Once secreted in the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop diuretic travels to the thick ascending loop of Henle where they block your sodium potassium to chloride channel. Now this channel is important in reabsorption of sodium as it reabsorbs up to 25% of all sodium load. And this results in osmotic gradient in the interstitium versus lumen. And this is very important for water reabsorption. This channel also results in electrochemical gradient across the lumen, so it aids in absorption of calcium and magnesium as well. Loop diuretics will block this channel, therefore they will cause interstitial dilution, so you will be unable to reabsorb sodium, potassium and chloride, and therefore water. Increased sodium delivery to the distal convoluted tubule now will result in more exchange of sodium with potassium, so this will result in hypokalemia, which loop diuretics are known for. Because of interstitial dilution, and this dilution is in equilibrium with the plasma osmotic pressure, the amount of sodium and water that are lost are equiosmolar. 
So you do not develop hyponatremia because of loop diuretics. Because of loss of electrochemical gradient, you also are unable to absorb calcium and magnesium and this will result in hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia. Loss of excess chloride in urine will result in metabolic alkalosis. Loop diuretics also block the sodium potassium chloride channel in macular denser and this is important because this stimulates renin secretion. And if you remember, renin activates your angiotensin 2 pathway and can decrease the GFR, therefore limiting the secretion of these loop diuretics into the proximal convoluted tubule. Excess sodium in the DCT will reduce the GFR through tubular glomerular feedback mechanism and loop diuretics inhibit this feedback and therefore can increase GFR as well. So the final GFR will result on the relative activity of renin versus this inhibition. Loop diuretics will also stimulate your sodium potassium trichloride channel type 1 in ear and your blood vessels. In ear they cause autotoxicity. In blood vessels these cause vasodilation and this is really important because they cause venodilations quite frequently and this decreases the preload. You would have noticed that patients with heart failure start feeling much better after dose of Lasix much sooner than their diuretic response and this is because of this venodilation and decreased preload effect of Lasix. Loop diuretics are threshold drugs. This means if you do not cross a certain serum concentration, you will not have any diuresis. And the amount of diuresis will depend upon the period of time that the serum concentration is higher than this threshold. Higher the dose, longer the duration of serum concentration above this threshold, therefore longer diuresis. And this is one of the reasons why continuous drips may be more effective as you are at level higher than threshold for longer period of time. We will learn in the next few slides that this threshold may be higher for patients with CKD and congestive heart failure. So if you do not reach this threshold, you will not have enough diuresis. Loop diuretics also have a ceiling effect. That means increasing a dose beyond a certain serum concentration will not result in more diuresis. And this is your ceiling. So if you give higher dose, you can see that your serum concentration is much higher. However, the amount of urine that is produced extra by this higher concentration is not significantly high. The reason you are making more urine is because of longer period of time rather than higher concentration. And this is one of the reasons why increasing dose once your optimal diuresis is achieved does not result in significantly higher rate of diuresis. You can have longer diuresis, but the amount that you produce every hour will not change much. It is important to understand threshold and ceiling effect of loop diuretics. If you have adequate response from a certain dose of loop, to increase the diuresis, you don't have to increase the dose, you have to increase the frequency. If you do not have response to that dose of loop diuretic, increasing the frequency will not work because you have not crossed that threshold with that dose. In these patients, you have to increase the doses rather than frequency. The threshold is higher in patients with heart failure and CKD. In a normal person, the threshold for Lasix is around 10 mg and this increases to 80 to 160 mg in CKD and heart failure. That means you will get an inadequate diuretic response. Also, natriuresis is lower in patients with heart failure and CKD as compared to healthy person. That means with the same dose of Lasix in these two groups, you will get lower natriuresis in patients with CKD and congestive heart failure. There are two phenomena in loop diuretics that you have to understand, breaking phenomena and post-diuretic sodium retention. As you continue the diuresis, you'll observe that the amount of natriuresis goes down with time. And sometimes a point will come when amount of natriuresis from that dose of loop diuretic is equal to the amount of sodium intake. This is called a breaking phenomena and this will make your loop diuretic more inefficient. Second is your post-diuretic sodium retention. That means after any dose of loop diuretic, once it weans off, your kidney starts retaining sodium and chloride more than what they did at the basal level. So for example, in this figure, your urine sodium excretion was around 30 prior to Lasix. Once the effect of Lasix has gone down completely, you can see that the natriuresis has fallen down to 15. This is your post-diuretic sodium chloride retention. And this happens because of two reasons. First, loop diuretic stimulate your sodium potassium two chloride channel in macular denser that stimulates your renin angiotensin system. 
Also, the volume depletion that is coming from your loop diuretics also stimulate your sodium retaining pathways. And you know that the stimulation of your angiotensin 2, aldosterone and sympathetic system results in more salt and water retention. The breaking phenomenon is a little bit more complex. It involves nephron remodeling but some part of decreasing natriuresis can be from activation of your renin angiotensin system. Both of these phenomena will reduce effectiveness of your loop diuretics. To prevent post-diuretic sodium retention and achieve significant diuresis, make sure that you repeat furosemide at dose of 6 to 8 hour interval and make sure that you limit the sodium intake. Let's understand nephron remodeling. You remember that most of the sodium absorption happens in the proximal convoluted tubule followed by thick ascending loop of Henle and around 5 to 6 percent happens in your distal convoluted tubule and proximal collecting duct. With loop diuretics, you completely inhibit your absorption in your thick ascending loop. So over time, your body tries to adjust for this change and reabsorbs more sodium in your DCT and collecting duct. And over time, you will observe hypertrophy and hyperplasia of this region. This remodeling increases your reabsorptive capacity of distal nephron by activating three channels. First, thiazide-sensitive sodium chloride co-transporter. Second, epithelial sodium channel in your principal cell. And chloride bicarbonate exchanger, pendrin, in your intercalated cell. Thiazide-sensitive sodium chloride co-transporter accounts for up to 75% of all diuretic resistance. We'll discuss the clinical implication of re nephron remodeling and its management when you discuss diuretic resistance. To summarize, use IV loop diuretics for decongesting congestive heart failure while in hospital. Understand that loop diuretics are threshold drugs and have a ceiling effect. If you have limited diuretic response, increase the dose rather than frequency. If you have good response, just increase the frequency if you need more diuresis. Use of continuous tip may help more diuresis as compared to the intermittent dose if you are able to achieve a level above the threshold. Schedule furosemide every 6 hours to prevent post-diuretic sodium retention and keep above the threshold level. The complications of loop diuretics include hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia and metabolic alkalosis and hyperuricemia. Use of bumetanide may help diuresis better than furosemide in advanced CKD patient because this drug is also filtered through the glomeruli. Breaking phenomena or diuretic resistance can occur due to nephron remodeling and it reduces the efficacy of the loop diuretics. Now you understand the important clinical pharmacokinetics of loop diuretics. Now we can understand how to use it. So in next few lecture, we'll discuss it further and try to answer some common question like if one loop diuretic is better than other, is continuous strip better? Should you use albumin with the loops, etc.? These are the references. Thank you.